Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming along. I think it's going to be a very uh, stimulating evening. We've got a, a, a great panel um, to hear from tonight. Um, before I introduce them, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention, some of you may have seen the news today, but uh, it, I, I'm not sure if this was deliberate, but the timing is, is quite fortuitous because there's you know, quite an important um, report out today from uh, the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee uh, on the impact of the, of the winter floods, which is probably you know, the most uh, prominent extreme weather, weather event or series of events in, in uh, the UK public's mind. Um, and one of the things they said in that report was that the amount of money that's put, put out there for, uh, for funding flood defences um, is, is kind of not enough at the moment and needs to increase with the risk posed by climate change. So we, uh, we can explore some of that this evening. One of the things they said was the sudden and sustained nature of the winter floods uh, uh, underlined the serious need for coherent policies and sufficient funding to protecting communities, homes, businesses and farmland. Um, so let me, uh, before I introduce the panel, we're, we're, the way we're going to do things is the first sort of 45 minutes we'll um, set things up, have a bit of a discussion, uh, then there'll be a break where you can recharge your glasses and um, afterwards I will uh, throw it open to the floor. So please, uh, it'd be great to have loads of questions, but um, hang on to them for the, for the second half. First of all, um, uh, to my right, uh, a man who stepped into the breach at the last minute, um, for which we're very grateful, um, Bob Ward, who <coughs> is uh, Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment and LSE. Uh, before that, he was uh, with the Royal Society for eight years, uh, was Head of Media Relations there, and is a, a, a Fellow of the Geological Society. Um, on my far right is um, Stephen Belcher, who is Professor of Meteorology at uh, the University of Reading, um, and also uh, Deputy Director of Climate Science at the, uh, at the Met Office, um, and author of uh, a report earlier this year, Drivers and Impacts of, uh, of the Seasonal Weather in the UK. So uh, I hope we're going to hear uh, a lot about uh, the flooding uh, from, from Stephen. And uh, George Marshall on my left is uh, founder of the Climate Outreach and Information Network. Um, uh, he's got 25 years of experience in, in the environment movement and in environment world in general. Um, uh, had positions at uh, Greenpeace and the Rainforest Foundation and is an advisor to the Welsh Government on uh, climate communications. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen a quote saying that your standard routine is uh, reasonably entertaining for a two-hour climate change PowerPoint presentation. So yeah, yeah it's, a low, it's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, but first of all, I, I'd like to start with um, uh, with with uh, with Stephen. So if you could sort of kick us off, and then we'll mm -hmm. take it from there. So earlier um, last year and earlier this year, we saw the publication of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the focus of that report is really on global climate and how that may have changed uh, over the last century and a half or so. So you'll be familiar with the famous plot showing the increase in the global mean surface temperature. since so the temperature near the surface of the Earth averaged over the whole Earth and how that's risen over the last 150 years. And what the fifth assessment report was able to say is that the warming is unequivocal, so that's as strong a statement as we can really make in science to say that there is a global signal of warming. And the second conclusion of this report, major conclusion, I would say, is that that warming is very likely due to human activities. So what I'm trying to say here is that the focus of this report was really on global long-term trends. And I think the reason that we're here today is to think about how this global change, what does it mean for us living in our region and over the course of our lifetime? You know, a global temperature, I don't feel that, and I don't think you do. I feel that it's warm today and it may rain next week. So, so the question that I think we're trying to set up today is what does climate variability, the natural fluctuations in the climate, mean for the seasons? Do we get more hot summers, more wet winters? And what happens to the cold winters? Do we lose them entirely or do we lose them gradually? So it's these really extreme seasons 
that I think is the main interest for us in the Met Office Hadley Centre now. And understanding whether we can, what we can say about the role of climate change in changing the odds of those events and how those events might change into the future. So that's what I mean by a climate extreme, which I think is the topic for this evening. And just to set us up a bit further, I, I, when we talk about extreme weather, what, what do we know about the link between extreme weather and climate change? Is there a link? And, and if so, what is it? And what kind of extreme weather are we talking about? So you've heard many climate scientists say that you can't attribute climate change to a single event. I think that means one rain shower. When taken over seasons, actually, that's what we're trying to do now. We're trying to say, was that wet winter that we saw, that we just had, what was the role of climate change in changing the odds of that event? And we may come back to that later. That's the one that we have trouble saying anything definitive about, actually. But if I go back a bit further, 2003, those of you with long memories, uh, in fact, I worked in London at that time, was a really hot summer, and it broke lots of records right across Europe. It was a hot summer. And we were able to do some analysis at the Hadley Centre that demonstrated that the emission of greenhouse gases, and so human-induced climate change, doubled the odds of that event. So without the greenhouse gases, we would have halved the probability of that event. And in the intervening 10 years, we've now got 10 more years of data. And you may not think there have been heat waves across Europe in that intervening 10 years, but actually, when taken over southern Europe, and including the UK, we've had many other hot summers. And in fact, we continue on a warming trajectory. So, so when we did our attribution statement that said that the odds were, were doubled because of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we could also say that by the 2040s, on the current trajectory of greenhouse gases, a summer like 2003 would become the norm in Europe. Well, I can tell you that the data shows that over the last 10 years, we continue on that trend that will take us, we think, by the 2040s, that a summer like 2003 will be the norm. So that's, that's what we call in the jargon an attribution statement. Why should we believe those models? I mean, you know, it's, it's very, very hard, notoriously hard to predict the weather. How can you possibly know that the odds were doubled for that 2003 event? So, so it's notoriously hard to predict the weather, but these are long-term periods of hot weather, so temperature we're much better at than rainfall, and again, I'm sure we'll come back to that. Yeah. So temperature tends to have bigger patterns, so we can be more confident that the patterns we're seeing in the models are correct over these seasonal timescales. And the other thing to say is that Europe is a very special place, particularly uh, around the Mediterranean, because um, as it warms, the soil dries out, and that means that the air gets even warmer. So there's kind of a doubling effect. There's the greenhouse gases. But as the ground uh, dries out, any warming warms even more because it can't evaporate moisture any further. And, and just, to, just to rewind slightly, what is the difference between weather and climate? So, there's a, there's a quote about this. Uh, weather, climate's what you expect, but weather's what you get. So in other words, you know, the summer's warm and the winter's hot. That's a kind of crude statement of climate. Climate is a long-term average over a large area. Weather is what's going to happen in your backyard tomorrow. What we're really talking about here is that middle ground of regional, so continental scale patterns over seasonal durations. So a hot summer over Europe or a cold winter over the northern US or a wet Australia. OK, that's a, that's a good starting point. Thanks very much. Um, so I should say that um, George has a, a book coming out called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. Um, so I'm hoping you're going to tell us a little bit about how people take on information about climate change and then how that affects their behavior and how they think about the phenomenon. Um, yeah, could you elaborate? Well, I, as I always assumed, I think like many people working in the field, like many scientists I've spoken to, that uh, increasingly extreme weather events would have a correlating effect on uh, acceptance of climate change or acceptance of, uh, of the science of what the scientists were saying. Uh, and this is a private view of many scientists, I'm, I'm sure in the Met Office too, but, but the one would lead to the other, but surely there's a point at which we know that climate change is a difficult issue for us to come to terms with because it lacks many of the qualities of salience, what psychologists would call salience, um, that bring things to our attention and give priority. So 
it seems quite distant, it seems far away, it seems in the future. Um, it's not quite clear. It doesn't have an enemy coming at us. We respond very well to things which are direct, visible, happening now and where we can see an enemy. So it's, it's a difficult issue for us. However, with an extreme weather event, it's here, it's now, and you can see it. So the assumption is, of course, that that connects through for people to think that, that but to an increased appreciation of the science. That is not necessarily, however, the case, because, of course, the reason I might think that is because I'm already convinced of the science. What is very clear from the research is that people tend to um, assimilate the views on climate change which, already, which concur best to the views they already hold. So, if you are somebody who is already convinced of climate change, you will see an extreme weather event as very clear evidence that, that the climate is changing. Indeed, whether even if the scientists are not saying very clearly that an individual event is caused by climate change, you will interpret it as so. If you are not inclined to accept it, if you are as yet unconvinced, then you are inclined to see it as, as evidence and proof that weather is naturally variable. So in other words, we're, we're tending to perceive what goes on around us very much through the lens of our, of our existing views and our existing worldview. There was a, a YouGov poll done uh, last year that asked people, do you think that uh, increasingly extreme weather is proof of climate change, split right down the middle? And the split was very interesting. Whilst two-thirds of people with left-leaning politics were inclined to say that it was proof of climate change, two-thirds of people with right-leaning politics were inclined to say it was not. When you see that kind of political polarisation, it is very clear that what, what is operating here is not really an excess of science, it's an excess of culture. But culture is operating and mediating. So, for the research for the book, I asked another question, which is, people who have been immediately impacted by climate change, who have just gone through an extreme event, which is off the scale in terms of their previous historic experience, does that change what they say or think about climate change? So I went to Bastrop in, in Texas that had had uh, wildfires after uh, a record-breaking drought, had had wildfires were by a factor of 10, the most destructive ever experienced in Texas, burnt down two-thirds of a town, huge areas of, uh, of forest burnt down. And I asked people, I allowed people to talk about the fire and experience, and then I asked them a very simple question. I said, could you tell me about the last conversation that you had with somebody about the relationship between what you went through and your experiences and climate change? Not a single person could remember a single conversation that they had ever had linking the two. And the, the editor of a local newspaper said, oh, sure, it's like we, we, we would cover this if we felt that this was relevant to us here in Bastrop County but we're just a local newspaper covering community issues. So in other words, there's a total detachment between what people were talking about and what was happening wider. I found a similar thing in New Jersey. Now, New Jersey, mind you, is not Republican, it's Democrat, so you would expect people to accept climate change, and privately they do. You ask them and they say, yes, climate change is a huge problem, so they're politically inclined to accept it. Same thing, when was the last time you talked about it? They're not talking about climate change in regards to what they've been through. But they are talking about community, pulling together, strength, rebuilding. And I, really, my conclusion on this, and this is an under-researched area, is that the narrative of climate change, because after all, we perceive it through the narrative, this culturally formed narrative, that the narrative of climate change is immensely challenging to communities that have just been through an extreme weather event. There, the language is all about community cohesion, pulling together, rebuilding. The last thing anybody there wants to hear about is that this might be the beginning, might be the opening omen or the signal of something which is going to get worse and is going to progressively challenge and threaten their way of life. So people are actively, I would say, pushing this to, to the edge of their attention. Is it, is it even worse than that? Because you know, another part sometimes of that message is that you have to change your way of life. Indeed Which so. is the last thing they want to hear, having just had it's their house absolute, Exactly, exactly. This is a time when people have a, have a reinvested sense of their own identity and their way of life. This is not a good position for people to have the self-reflection which is required for climate change to say maybe we should do things differently. Also a time when people from right across political boundaries have come together in a sense of strong community identity. So they're very, very actively avoiding any discussion of something which might be divisive. And I think the other thing to remember is that people if you, if you have just had, I mean, New Jersey, I have to say, is extraordinary. I went there six months after um, Hurricane Sandy hit, and it's just matchwood. I mean, uh, all along the coast, just smashed to pieces. 
If you are going into that and you are rebuilding, you are in the act of rebuilding, you are investing in a positive vision of the future. We know, that, we know psychologically that there is a tendency towards an optimism bias, whereby people tend to have an optimistic view of what's happening. So in some of the research that's been done, people tend to hugely overestimate the chance that the next hurricane will hit somewhere else, and hugely <laughs> underestimate the chances that the next hurricane will hit them. It's a natural psychological response to going through a trauma that you tend to underestimate the likelihood of it hitting you again. So people are gambling. It's a, it's a gambler's instinct. You're taking the gamble, but it's not going to happen again. And like all gamblers, you tend to have an over-optimistic assumption of what's going to come next. So I guess the conclusions of saying that this is extremely complex. And I think the thing I'd say is that alongside the, the hard science of climate change, of the scientific facts of climate change, although I realize scientists are wary of the word fact, but the scientific facts of climate change, they're social facts too. And the social facts are what, in the end, governs people's views and opinion. And it's we're constantly looking and monitoring for the views of the people around us, the people we trust, our peers, and so on, for the position we should hold. Or I would add, in these affected areas, whether we should be even seen to hold views at all, whether it is even appropriate to talk about climate change in the midst. Because that's the final thing, as I'm saying, people, people are very unwilling to talk about. I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the political observation that you made. Um, you know, the, uh, who's, whose fault is that? Because this can be a very divisive political issue. It's not always the case, but particularly in the US, you know, it's a badge of honor for um, you know, large sections of the Republican Party to, to reject um, the science and, it, and anything that flows from it. Whose fault is that? I really don't think it's a matter of fault. Um, I think it is, I think a number of unfortunate things have happened. I think if I was inclined to say people who have been a bit negligent on it, so maybe not fault, is I think that conservatives or people of conservative politics who understand and care about climate change have been far too uh, unwilling and too slow to step forward and to say, no, this, isn't, this is a conservative issue too, and to shape it in lines with their own, their own values. Um, and my own organization, COIN, has done a lot of work with conservatives to try and find new ways of talking about climate change. So I think part of the problem is for people on the right, it's become poisoned because it, it seems to be built entirely around the values of the left, mm. from their point of view. Is that the fault of, pe of people on the left, though? Because it, you know, it sort of chimes with being able to control free enterprise, regulation, all of those things that come more naturally, perhaps, to people on the left. Well, but then again, what you just described, then, is also partly the narrative that has been created by people on the left. You could equally well say that people on the right have to take action on climate change in defense of their freedoms and their property, because climate change is the greatest possible threat to those things. There's no way that, there's no reason that it needs to take on any particular shape. Just as I would always say that the reason it has a polar bear as the icon of climate change is solely because environmentalists were the first of a, <laughs> were the first of a, you know, the, the, the starting, the starting point when it came to climate change. So they stuck a polar bear on it. You know, if it had been human rights organisations, it wouldn't have a bear. It would have something very different. <laughs> so, um, but what I do think is that what is interesting is that in the in the early stages, up to about 2000, in the US certainly. People, Democrats and, the Democrats and Republicans were about neck and neck in terms of their attitudes on climate change. That there was not that clear polarization, and that generally speaking, people who knew more about science and were more alert to scientific issues on both sides were more concerned about climate change. And then after 2000, it starts pulling apart. And what is dangerous with this is rather just as climate change has its own positive and negative feedbacks, so does social opinion. So what happens is once it starts moving apart, and once you, if you are, say, a conservative, you start to see that people around you who you trust are saying, no, I don't believe that. Whilst at the same time, people you distrust, like we might say Al Gore, for example, if you were, if you were strongly Republican, are saying, yes, this is the biggest issue we face, that it starts to pull further and further away. The danger, of course, with any issue now, which includes extreme weather events, is that the interpretation of what we need is we need everybody to pull together and to, to, to have a new combined sense of identity and purpose. But the danger is that these two interpretations pull people apart. So that one group goes ahead saying, this is proof of what we're telling you, you've got to pay attention. And the other saying, no, this is just evidence that this is a myth. And that things can become more polarized and also more fractured through the process of coping with understandable trauma. Um, one of the things, of course, is that if you've been through a major trauma, one of the things which uh, what happens is that people say, no, this is not the appropriate time to talk about this. 
So but people are trying to get in and say, no, this, this might be climate change. It's like I'll seem to be actively, actively undermining uh, people, actively undermining and, and reinforcing people's suffering. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's interesting what you're saying because it, 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 it seems to be that the, uh, uh, everything that surrounds kind of nat uh, natural disaster type events is, is actually quite unhelpful with, with respect to kind of communicating generally about, uh, about climate change. It's a, there's a, an interesting piece that my colleague um, George Monbiot wrote today in the, in the paper which, in which he sort of describes a kind of um, epiphany moment where he's realised that the way he's been talking about a lot of environmental issues has perhaps not been right. He says, uh, I've been engaged in contradiction and futility for about 30 years, which uh, perhaps some of his detractors might have said earlier, but anyway. Um, uh, he's, he says, uh, we, we terrify the living daylights out of people and they will protect themselves at the expense of others in the living world. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, does that chime with what you're saying? I think I, I have to say, as somebody who, as, as you said in your introduction, I've worked my entire working life in the environment movement, I have to say that there is some responsibility there for the way that we've done this. I don't think that it is, and as you asked if it's someone's fault, I don't think it's environmentalist's fault. I think the weakness has been that environmentalists speak to their own constituency, just as everybody speaks to their own constituency, just as the church speaks to people who go to church or businesses or, you know, the CBI speaks to businesses. I think that the problem has been we have not been alert to a need that, that not been alert to the fact that if we're all going to come together on a combined issue, we have to have lots of different people speaking in different ways. Um, there's somebody who I, I find very interesting who's the head of the, um, the, uh, the, the Catholic Coalition for the Unborn Child in, uh, in the States. I think I've got the name right. Um, and he's going out there and he's saying climate change is the greatest threat to the rights of the unborn child. And I'm thinking, wow, this is extraordinary. When people who are outside the normal political arena talk about it, it looks completely different. And why not? And why not? So that's what I would say. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm quite with George. It's not so much we've talked about it the wrong way, but we've been talking about it one way. And the need is to find, if we're going to bring everybody together on this, the need is to find a way which crosses those boundaries and finds common values. OK, thanks very much. Sure. Um, Bob, what's your perspective? Well, I'm going to dive straight in and, and come back to the issue of the floods this winter because um, I think it's, it, it could prove to be a decisive moment in the UK political debate. Um, there was an article, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, by, in which uh, John Gummer, who is head of the Statutory Committee on Climate Change, said that he had detected in Westminster a change in attitude amongst Conservative MPs since the flooding, and they had made the connection between the floods and climate change, and were no longer hostile to the idea that they should be acting on it. And I mean, Stephen will give chapter and verse on the science of it, but here's some basic facts that help you sort your way through. So it's the wettest winter uh, the UK has experienced since records began in 1910. Uh, it, we have experienced four of the five wettest years have occurred in the UK from the year 2000 onwards, and that doesn't count this year with the wettest winter. And during that period, seven, we've had seven of the warmest years. Now we know from basic physics, you don't need a climate model, you warm the atmosphere, it holds more water, you expect uh, stronger downpours, and that indeed is what we're beginning to see in the UK. Now, there is a tendency in this debate, perversely, to demand absolute certainty. We're not going to accept it's climate change until you're absolutely certain. And this is a little bit like going to the doctor with lung cancer and being a heavy smoker. I said, doctor, I'm not going to take it as smoking unless you can tell me categorically which cigarette it is that's given me um, cancer. It's a perverse way of dealing with risk. And the risks are very clear and apparent. You don't have to be certain, but you can see enough to know that there are risks there. And these are risks that we have some choices about. So there's an inertia in the climate system, which means that probably for the next two or three decades, this risk is going to grow no matter what we do about greenhouse gas emissions, which is the primary driver of these changes we're seeing. So we're going to have to adapt in the UK over the next two or three decades to the increase in flood risk. Beyond that will depend on how well the world 
uh, mitigates and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Now, so you don't even have to believe in uh, in there being a, a case in, in there being strong action in the future to have to deal with this problem of what happens in the next two or three decades in the UK. And it's being driven by two main things. So first of all, sea level is rising. There are parts of the UK that are still readjusting from the last ice age and causing the uh, parts of the coast to rise and sink. The southeast is sinking and, as long as, and with sea levels rising is particularly uh, exposed to coastal flooding. You remember that the big storm in December, um, which kind of got obliterated from people's memories by the later flooding, was the biggest storm surge we've seen for 60 years. 1953 was the previous biggest one and caused a lot of a loss of life and led to the process that, for instance, gave us uh, the building of the uh, uh, London Thames, uh, the Thames Barrier. So we see the risk very clearly and we have to act. And what is worrying is that if you go and see the um, plans that are being put in place by the government, we see evidence of the, uh, of the phenomenon that um, George described, where depending on your point of political view, you change, you have a different attitude towards how you should manage that risk. And it is unfortunate that Owen Paterson has decided, as the minister responsible primarily, the cabinet minister responsible for adapting the country to climate change, he has spent most of his time disputing the science of climate change. And the reason why that is dangerous, I'll give you an example. So next year, the uh, insurance companies and the government have agreed to introduce a new fl insurance system, fl flood insurance system. At the moment, uh, people who live in high-risk properties are essentially subsidized by everybody else with flood insurance. They don't pay a premium that reflects their risk. They pay a lower premium, and we all pay, everybody else pays extra. Now, what's happened is that we're seeing an increase in risk, an increase in flood claims, and the insurance industry said to the government, this is no longer sustainable, and we need to work out a new system. Up until then, the go uh, government had agreed with the insurance industry that the insurance industry would, pri would offer flood insurance to the vast majority of people. In return, the government would increase its spending on flood defences. The government's decided it doesn't really want to do that deal. And so they've come up with this new system where there'll be a pool of money that will be used to pay for these, the people who are at highest risk. And we will all pay about or 10 pounds more on your premium. So there'll be an explicit charge on your flood insurance from next, on your insurance for next year that will represent um, su subsidies for those at highest risk. Now when this proposal was put out for consultation last June by DEFRA, they did not include climate change in their thinking. And this is a system that's supposed to run for 25 years to 2040. And all they had to do was go and look at the climate change risk assessment, which Owen Patterson's predecessor at DEFRA, Caroline Spellman, had published, showing the predictions for how much uh, an increase in the number of properties that are going to, be, uh, going to be at high risk of flooding. And they simply ignored evidence that they had published. And that is an example, I, I'm afraid, where an ideological approach, deciding you're not going to believe in climate change, has real consequences for people. It's going to be a problem because potentially this new scheme that they're launching next year is going to be unsustainable because they haven't planned for any increase in the number of claims uh, for flooding, even though the evidence is there from their own department that that's what they expect. But you started off by saying you, th you thought that the winter flooding events would, uh, would be sort of instrumental and be a real turning point and that there was you know, political movement on, you know, in Patterson's own party. Are you saying that that just hasn't impacted on him or that department at all? Well, I, one test will be to see whether Owen Patterson remains environment secretary after the reshuffle that's coming up. Um, I mean, 
There are a lot of, let's, let's be clear, it's not just flooding that he's having problems with. Remember, he's the one who accused the badgers of moving the goalposts when the cull didn't quite kill off the badgers as they were expecting. So he's been struggling with the whole of his brief, but frankly, his staying in that position and the way he's done it, he's taken the team that's responsible for climate change adaptation and he cut it from 38 down to six people. And that, I don't know, you'll have your chance to speak in a minute. Um, so they've cut this team that's responsible for overview, taking an overview of our resilience to, um, to climate change. And that's the kind of thing that's going to have a big, big impact because you're seeing that now. The report today, one of the things it didn't do was point out, as the Committee on Climate Change has done, is that government spending on flood defences is not rising in line with the recommendations of the Environment Agency about how you build the flood defences to keep pace with uh, climate change and the way it's increasing flood risk. Now, let's be clear, flood defences are not going to be the, the way in which we deal with this. It's one way of dealing with it. In particular in, in London, our biggest risk from flooding is surface water flooding, which will potentially overwhelm our uh, very old sewer system. And we saw ample evidence of that in many cities in 2007, when we had more than three billion pounds worth of damage done across the country, m most of which was inflicted in, in uh, cities. In fact, ironically, in Hull, they suffered a lot of flooding in the center of their city, having just opened a massive tidal um, defense mechanism to protect them from storm surges. So we are going to have to deal with the fact that sea level is rising, increasing the risk of, of coastal flooding, that there's evidence that uh, the uh, rain that's falling is falling in more intense uh, bouts. That's going to cause an increased risk, potentially, of river flooding and surface water flooding. And beyond that, beyond the next two or three decades, will depend on how successful the UK and every other country is at cutting greenhouse gas emissions, which is why we equally have to pay attention to the political process now leading forward to trying to sign an international agreement in Paris in 2015. I'll say it, uh, last point here, is that you should go and have a look at the joint statement that's, uh, that's been released by the... Um, Chinese Prime Minister and David Cameron today on climate change, in which the, both countries acknowledge the seriousness and the urgency of the problem of climate change. Now, amongst those who argue against action, they always go, oh, the Chinese don't care, they're just going to carry on. But they're people who have either never spoken to anybody from China or have never been there. China takes climate change very, very seriously because it understands that there's no point bringing a lot of people out of poverty if you're going to plunge them back in because they'll be spending all their time dealing with increased damage from, uh, from weather. They understand that poor people are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And that's why we should be understanding that this process now of both driving towards our own responsibilities, cutting our emissions by 80% by 2050, we have to do, and we also have to encourage every other country to similarly take action. I think the nub of the argument here is a lot of things you've talked about, um, both on the adaptation side and on the mitigation side, are, are incredibly expensive. And going back to your um, analogy of the smoker going to the, the doctor, it's useful up to a point, isn't it? Because you get to, uh, the difference is that the smoker, all they've got to do is give up smoking and that may well help. Maybe it's too late, but it might help. Whereas uh, what you're asking people to do is uh, to go in for a lot of you know, expensive measures that could harm the economy, people argue, and therefore you're not, you're not just asking them to do something that won't have much of an impact. And all of that is based on a risk calculation that you can't be sure about. Um, so that, that's why it's difficult, isn't it? Well, I mean, it's interesting to ask uh, how much would somebody be willing to spend to avoid death? Um, is there a, a level at which they say, no, you know what, I'm not going to pay that. I'd much rather spend it on something else. So it is really about the risk here. And the risks we're talking about are very, very serious risks. One of the dangers 
is that we look at the ch climate change that's already happening and we think that climate change in the future is just going to be a slightly worse version. Now we're talking about potential risks here that are, are almost unimaginable. So we're heading towards a situation where there's a severe, if we do not reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases, we could by the end of the century be talking about temperatures in excess of two, degree, two degrees warmer than pre-industrial times. Now the Earth has not had experienced that uh, level of temperature on a sustained basis for millions of years. So millions of years, humans have been around for about a modern human species about 200,000 years. Most of civilization was built in the last 12,000 years since the last major ice age. So we're talking about going towards this period about three million years ago when uh, the polar ice caps were much smaller and um, sea level, global sea level was about five to ten meters higher than it is today. That's where we're heading if we do not reduce our emissions. And anybody who tells me, ah, oh, you know what, we'll just adapt. I mean, it's just madness. It, that is no way to manage risk. We don't have historical, we don't have experience in this room, don't have historical experience, we don't have evolutionary experience of, of that climate. We're creating a prehistoric climate. And what's more, it's not just our lives and livelihoods we have to worry about. It's all the future generations who will have to deal with the consequences. So the question is, is are you willing to take that gamble? Are you willing to say, you know what, doctor, unless you can tell me which cigarette I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up smoking. Or are you going to say, you know what, I understand this and I'm going to take measures. So let's deal with the cost issue, the cost of, of, um, yeah. So there is an investment to be made in order to convert from our current economy, which is largely dependent on fossil fuels, high carbon, and convert it towards one that is a low carbon. And that is an investment. But um, at the moment, remember, we're essentially pumping out greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which is a form of pollution because it causes harm, and nobody pays for that. You pick it up in terms of the damage that is done uh, to you through climate change. It's not a charge on the polluters. So at the moment, the cost of, of uh, products and services that involve the release of greenhouse gases emissions are artificially cheap. That's the basis for putting an extra charge, a carbon price on. So once you start doing this and you start investing in alternatives that don't release greenhouse gas emissions, you start to see a convergence. And the fact is that in the future, we're going to probably need to, as a world, um, invest about 1% of global GDP in order to avoid these very, very serious risks. Now that's not an insubstantial sum, but given the alternative, it is quite affordable. And what's more, it won't be just the fact that we avoid the climate risks. The Chinese are interested, for instance, in shutting down their coal-fired power station because there'd be an immediate benefit in terms of an increase in the quality of air in their uh, cities. You see Beijing suffering from deadly smogs, terrible smogs, uh, which is uh, disrupting lives, disrupting economic activity. So all those other co-benefits associated with creating a cleaner, more efficient economy. So there is plenty there for us to want, and it's very attractive, and it's affordable. I'd like to bring things back to the UK. In your, in your introduction, Stephen, you, you talked about how your job is about understanding what this kind of means for us. Mm. Um, and you, you alluded to the attributing uh, the link between climate change and the, and the winter flooding and that being a little bit complicated. Could you get in, into some of that? This is the chapter and verse that uh, Bob <laughs> yeah. kindly uh, introduced <laughs> me. Yes. So yes, here's the chapter and verse. So, so I talked about attributing um, hot periods, so high temperatures, to climate change. And we can do that fairly well now. So, so we heard earlier from George about the Texas heat wave and we can make an attribution statement that that's much more likely because of climate change. I don't have the numbers no. uh, with me. Rainfall is much more difficult, um, and it's kind of interestingly difficult. So when we get high rainfall over a winter like we did this time, it's the product of two effects. It's the amount of rain you get out of a single storm multiplied, if you like, by the number of storms you get. And what we got this winter was an awful lot of storms chucking out an awful lot of rain. 
So it's those two things which respond differently, potentially, to climate change that we have to unravel. This is why, scientifically, it's a difficult task. So the amount of rain that each storm dumps on us, that's the, the thing that Bob mentioned, that in a warmer world, the atmosphere holds more water so it can rain more out. So we're really very confident of that, and there is evidence accumulating around the world, not specific to the UK, but around the world, that that, that, that is, we're observing that effect. What is much more difficult to say anything about is whether we are seeing more storms because of climate change. And that's really the next generation of climate science to, to try and understand that. And it, it's, it's hard for the reason that you challenged me earlier, because what we're trying to understand is how weather systems are going to change in a changing climate. And you challenged me as to whether the models are good enough for this kind of thing. I think they are beginning to get better but there's, there's a lot more work to do on that. So that's why rainfall is difficult. It's the amount of rain in individ individual storm that is higher, but it's the number of storms and that's more difficult. And in terms of the work that's been done on the, the storms in this winter particularly, where are we with that? So um, the group at Oxford led by Miles Allen, and I think uh, Adam is a member of his group, have done one of these attribution statements and they do show a small increase in the rainfall because of climate change, and I think it is this warmer world holding more moisture. Um, the interesting step that they're now taking is saying, OK, given that rainfall, how does that affect the flood risk? And actually, they see a much bigger effect of human-induced climate change on the flood risk compared to the rainfall. And it's because of where the rain fell and, and the kind of duration of it. And on, on the modelling overall, I mean, I, I suspect this is something that people in the audience will have heard a bit about, you know, that, there hasn't been a great deal of, of, uh, of warming since 1998. What's going on there? Why, you know, the models didn't predict that. Why should we trust your models now? Yeah. So, so this is back to the global mean temperature. So since in the last 15 years or so, the global mean temperature has risen slightly, but much less rapidly than it did since the 1970s. Um, if you look at model simulations of warming due to greenhouse gases over a period of 100 years, we expect about two periods of 15 years when there is little warming. We expect other periods when there's more rapid warming than average. So this is what I was trying to say at the beginning, that um, climate change is really the science of global averages over long 30, 40 year timescales. So, so it's not unexpected, if we interrogate the models, these regions um, of less warming. It's very important to say that although the global mean temperature hasn't risen, there are many other indicators of a warming world. So shrinking sea ice in the Arctic, shrinking glaciers, less um, snow. For me, the most persuasive is the increase in sea level. So we see a sustained increase of sea level in about two millimetres uh, per year, continuing right through the, the last uh, 15 years, and that, that's a signature of a, of a climate system that's continuing to accumulate more heat and energy. Um, and do you, uh, going back to the, the impact on communication of these, uh, uh, of these kind of extreme events, when, when extreme events happen, is there a kind of huge influx of, of inquiries yeah. to the Met Office from people, or, or do you get those inquiries all the time anyway? Um, we do get lots of inquiries all the time, but, but you're right. I mean, things like the winter. Um, so Julius Lingo, my boss, and I put together a report on, on the, um, the, the meteorology that led to the flooding and the potential role of climate change on that, and it got downloaded 40,000 times. Now, I wouldn't claim it was read 40,000 times, but, <laughs> but um, th there's massive interest. And clearly, uh, well, we are coming full circle now. It's events like this through which we will see the impacts of climate change. It's events like this that raises it in all of our minds. And there are four categories. It's either too hot, too cold, too wet, or too dry. Those are the canonical events that, that bring it to our minds, I think. OK, um, we're, we're nearing the time when you can uh, you know, go and get some more wine, which I'm sure is very, very important to, to everyone. But so uh, some sort of final thoughts before we, uh, before we have a break. Um, uh, d any, anything that, um, uh, that Bob said that, that, that sort of, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of struck, there's a slight contradiction in the sense that uh, Bob was saying that, you know, the winter flooding is, is a sort of turning point event in, in the political discourse in the UK. Yes. Do you, but you, you, you were saying that actually, uh, you know, extreme events are a little bit unhelpful in certain ways. I mean, do, do you, is there a contradiction there? I think the thing I'd keep coming back to is that the wave of public attitudes and we could say belief, although I'm wary of a belief word because it has religious connotations, but we could say the conviction 
uh, but climate change is happening, is extremely complex without the direct correlation. We, we, we cannot assume, just as we cannot say an individual weather event, is, uh, is, is necessarily caused by climate change, we cannot necessarily assume that a single, a single trigger is going to produce a change in public attitude. And whilst I don't doubt that for, for some people this will be a seminal moment, um, attitudes to climate change are, generally speaking, people often talk about there being a, a moment when, uh, the, when the light goes on or uh, you know, a, a, a moment when they move from a situation being unsure about it to a situation being certain. So for some people that will undoubtedly happen. But I would say, I would say overall that I'm doubtful about whether that is happening across the population as a whole. So, um, you know, for people who are very much involved in the policy arena, this, this may be the case. But I think it is, ve I, with all respect to Bob, I think it is very hard for people like ourselves, and I suspect people in the audience who are both very involved with climate change in terms of utter conviction, in it, but also possibly in, in the audience who are not so sure about it, it is very hard for us to see anything concerning this issue with objectivity, because we're so emotionally involved in what we wish to see. So, um, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all run by the same kind of, the same sort of set of biases. It's one thing that we all have in common. So I would love to believe that this is a, that this is a, a moment for, for transforming public opinion. But the truth is, 20 years now we've been talking about climate change. Over that 20 years we've had a number of extreme weather events. They've been clocking up. Uh, there have been records broken time and time and time again. And yet the base level of general concern about climate change has still over that time not shifted significantly. In fact, over the last few years has tended somewhat to go down. So we are not seeing in a, you know, if this was, if this was, uh, if this was medicine, if this was epidemiology, we would be expecting to see some kind of correlation between the two. We're not seeing it. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're pretty much bang on for, uh, for our break. So, um, yeah, I encourage you to go and charge your glasses and come back with your questions for the second half.